Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well and if you're new here, what we do on Unfortunate Ends is talk about a number of things including crime, mystery and executions and more, so if you're interested in it, be sure to stick around. Anyway, today we'll be looking into the story of Emmett Till. I remember hearing of his life back when I was around 15 while I was doing my history GCSE and the tragedy of the case always stayed with me. He was still very young when his life was brutally ended for no reason. But who was Emmett Till and what exactly happened to him? Emmett Lewis Till was born on the 25th of July 1941 in the city of Chicago as the United States was on the cusp of its entry into the Second World War. An African American, he was born to working class parents on the south side of Chicago. His mother was Mamie Elizabeth Carthen and his father was Lewis Till. Lewis died in 1945 while serving in Italy during the Second World War. He had been accused and convicted of sexually assaulting a young woman and for murder and was hanged near Pisa in the north of the country in Tuscany. Emmett's mother had been born in the Mississippi Delta region but her family had moved north to Illinois when she was just two years old. Prior to Lewis's departure for the war front in Europe, she and Lewis had separated as she had discovered that he had been unfaithful and, indeed, there had been some disturbing evidence to suggest that Lewis had domestically abused her during the early years of the war in America, around 1942, when Emmett was still a toddler. Emmett's subsequent childhood was rather troubled. In 1947, when he was just six years of age, he contracted polio, a not uncommon disease for the mid 20th century but one which left Emmett with a stutter. Then his life became somewhat nomadic, as he and his mother moved temporarily to Detroit, Michigan. He was unhappy here, and his mother sent him back to Chicago to live with his grandmother, while she lived in Detroit and married a man named Pink Bradley. When she returned to Chicago after this newest relationship ran into trouble, Emmett's rebellious streak quickly showed itself. One day, when Bradley visited them back in Windy City, the 11-year-old Emmett pulled out a knife and threatened the grown man. It was an early sign of both his bravery in defending himself and his mother, but also demonstrated a rashness which would soon cause much greater difficulties for him as a young teen. When Till was barely 14 years of age in 1955, he was sent on a trip to rural Mississippi. He was a sprouting youth at this time, unusually tall for his age and nearly five and a half foot. Emmett's mother had relatives in Mississippi, from back before families such as hers had migrated towards the large industrial cities of the United States in the early 20th century in search of work and opportunities. Emmett's mother decided it would be good for him to spend some time away from Chicago in the serenity of the countryside, and so she sent him off to spend the summer with her relatives in the south. His mother, who was conscious that Emmett was a joker, who liked to be the centre of attention and who often got himself into trouble, sent him with a stern warning though. Mississippi, she warned, was not like the north. In the south, an African American had to be careful what they did and what they said, particularly when there were white people around. This was compounded by the political situation. Ever since the American Civil War of the early 1860s, a series of discriminatory laws which advocated for the segregation between blacks and whites in the South, and known to posterity as the Jim Crow laws, had held sway across states from Mississippi to Georgia. These effectively made African Americans, like the Tills, second class citizens. But racial tensions had been incited in 1954 when the US Supreme Court had voted in a landmark case to end certain aspects of segregation and the Jim Crow laws, particularly in the education system of the southern states. All of this had agitated many white Americans in the southern states on the eve of Emmett's trip to Mississippi in the summer of 1955. Emmett arrived in the town of Money, Mississippi on the 21st of August 1955. Here he was to stay with his great uncle, a farmer by the name of Moses Wright. Moses was not a rich man, 
but rather was a sharer cropper, which effectively meant that he made little more than a subsistence living off of his family's investment in cotton farming. Emmett arrived to help the family with the harvest, but within days, everything would take a violent and ultimately fatal turn. On the 24th of August, three days after his arrival in Mississippi, young Emmett and a group of other local youths went to a local grocery store in the evening, having been working in the cotton fields for much of that day. Exactly what happened there became the focus of immense debate, conjecture, and conflicting arguments. Such was the heated and racial nature of the debate in the days and weeks that followed, but some clear facts can be ascertained. While Emmett was in the shop, he had an exchange of some sort with a female cashier who was working by the counter, a woman named Caroline Bryant. Later arguments which sought to justify what subsequently happened to Till, suggests that he flirted with Caroline, whistled at her, or touched her hand. There were also reports that Emmett produced a picture of his school class in Chicago and noted how the black and white Americans were not segregated, as they were in Mississippi. While we may never know the exact specifics of the interaction, it was enough in the racially charged atmosphere of Mississippi in the mid-1950s to provoke a reaction. Four days later, in the early hours of the 28th of August, Caroline Bryant's husband, Roy Bryant, along with his half-brother, J.W. Millam, headed out to the Wright household, having obtained information about who the visitor to the region that had been in the store was. Moses was unaware of what had transpired about three and a half days earlier. There, Rob Bryant and J.W. Millam abducted young Emmett at gunpoint. Having taken him away, they then beat him severely and even gouged out one of his eyes. Emmett, a 14-year-old boy, one must remember, was then effectively mutilated by them at this point. Then, following this initial torture, they then took him to the local Tallahatchie River and there they shot him with a single bullet, killing him. Finally, the pair tied him to some dead weight and threw his body into the river. In the meantime, Emmett's great uncle Moses had reported the attack on his home and the abduction of Till to the police. Despite the racially charged atmosphere of the times and the fact that Till was an African American who had seemingly acted inappropriately towards a white woman, the police did act speedily at first. Rob Bryant and J.W. Millam were arrested on the 29th of August, the day after the murder, and a subsequent investigation recovered Emmett's body from the river two days after that, on the 31st of August. Given the severity of the assault, the gouging out of one of his eyes, the gunshot wound, and the fact that his body had been left to decay in the river for over three days before it was recovered, it was virtually unidentifiable by the time the authorities recovered it. Indeed, young Till's body was only positively identified on the basis of a ring which he was wearing which had been his father's. The trial of Rob Bryant and J.W. Millam was convened with strange speed. It began on the 19th of September 1955, just three weeks after they murdered Till. Moses Wright appeared and clearly identified the two men who had come into his house and abducted his great-nephew. But despite the fairly unequivocal evidence to this effect, when the four-day trial came to an end, it took the jury, which was composed entirely of white males, just one hour to acquit Bryant and Millam of all the charges placed against them. There had even been racist jokes uttered in the courtroom during the trial. One juror later joked that, they wouldn't have taken the 67 minutes which they did to reach their conclusion if we hadn't stopped to drink pop. When the result was read out, the two accused lit up cigars to celebrate. Incredibly, because of double jeopardy laws, a procedural defense which prevents individuals being tried on the same exact crime twice in the US, the pair were now effectively free from any kind of prosecution and even gave interviews in the months that followed essentially admitting to what they had done and 
why they're claimed to have tortured and murdered Till. One interview with a Look magazine even included extensive details of what they had done and why they had done it. They claimed to have not intended to kill Till, but when he bragged about his relations with white women, they changed their minds and murdered him. Even for the circumstances of the time, it was a brazen admission. Yet, while they escaped punishment for their crime, history was to have the last say. Before Bryant and Millam's trial ever occurred, Emmett's mutilated body was sent back to Chicago on the 2nd of September, two days after being recovered from the river. Emmett's mother Mamie Elizabeth now insisted on having an open coffin funeral. What Bryant and Millam had done to her son would be open for the entire world to see, and many people saw it. Outraged by the event, tens of thousands of people attended Till's funeral in Chicago, and many members of the press showed up to photograph Emmett's broken body and face in its coffin. His murder became a crucial moment in the growing civil rights movement which was just beginning to grip the United States. Emmett's death caused a nationwide scandal. There had been hundreds of such lynchings in southern states such as Mississippi for decades stretching back to the end of slavery itself in the 1860s, but the number of these had reduced greatly since the 1930s. Thus, what was shocking about Till's murder was that it happened, the brutality of it, the fact that it was committed against a 14-year-old boy by two adult men who subsequently went free, and that his mother chose to have an open coffin funeral for the whole world to see what had been done to her son. It was widely discoursed on, and the great mid-century writer William Faulkner, a Mississippian himself, wrote about the incident in his essay On Fear in 1956. Emmett's death and subsequent events are widely regarded as a critical moment in the civil rights movement. So was there any justice for Till in the end? There certainly was none for Bryant or Millam, but long after they died in 2004, the FBI reopened the case. After a three-year investigation, which included the exhumation of Emmett's body and a complete autopsy, new evidence did come to light. J.W. Millam's brother Leslie had been involved as well in the crime, a fact which had been largely unnoticed at the time, and a deathbed confession which he wrote years later, admitting his own culpability in the kidnapping and murder of Till was uncovered. Despite this, no new charges were brought. Nevertheless, Emmett Till's murder and the subsequent outrage which it sparked throughout the United States was a highly important moment in the development of the civil rights movement in America during the mid-1950s. Thank you so much for watching this video on Emmett Till, I hope you enjoyed. If you did, be sure to leave me a like and a comment down below. And if you're new, why not subscribe? If you have any suggestions, you can leave them down in the comments, or there's also links to my email and Instagram in the description. Anyway, that's all from me. So I'll see all of you in the next unfortunate end. Thanks.